we're here. Hopefully we are. Tonight, I got no tech info to share. Kind of slept half a day away. Very tired. Don't get old, folks. Oh, wait. You, you can't avoid it. But I'm going to take you through a little journey of mine and lead you up to how I got here doing videos. Let's do the intro right now. Hi folks, Tim here just cutting in. We're gonna uh, just tell you about TubeBuddy.com. If you are a creator on YouTube, you should be using this. Uh, the link it will be on the screen here, but it will also be in the description below. As you can see, the prices are, those are for the advanced licenses. You could try this for free. Um, they made me a really good offer. After I tried it for about a week, uh, I'm paying four fifty a month. Offer I could not refuse. So check that link again on the screen. Yeah, uh, TubeBuddy.com forward slash high end cheap tech, or check the description below when you're done watching the video. And that's all I have. Let's get right back to the video right now. I'm back. Sorry about the ad interruption, but if we don't advertise, we don't make money. So, here I am to tell you of my long journey into night. Or YouTube, as it were. At 18 years old, or 17, my dad promised me one thing. For my birthday when I turned 18 and that was luggage in other words you're gone college or the Navy I went in the Navy my brother had gone in the Navy my dad had been in the Navy in World War II uh, he had fought the Japanese uh, Although he begrudgingly bought me my first motorcycle. First mistake on his part. We'll get to that in a moment. That became an obsession later in life. But I went in the Navy. I got a good technical education, the equivalent of a, you know, an engineer. Uh, and I worked on avionics. And then one day, I mean, I had this great job. I got stationed in Bermuda. How can you go wrong? It's not as far south as you think, folks. It's straight 650 miles west of Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. But it's sitting in the middle of the Gulf Stream, 80 degrees, sunny skies. Winter lasts like a week, and it gets in the 50s. Oh, yeah, when you're 18, 19, 20. Well, I was like 20 by then. And I worked on aircraft, and I kept going back to Jacksonville, Florida for school. Good old Jacks. And I asked Jacks. Well, one day... because I hadn't paid attention to the fact I was getting rotated, I got rotated out. And uh, they sent me, they were like, oh, you're going to this squadron. And I was like, what the hell is an S3B or S3A? I can't remember exactly what I worked on. It was a long, long time ago. But I looked him up and asked around, and they had tail hooks. Guess what? 
I was going to get to work on the flight deck. Yay. Uh, the world's most dangerous job, by the way. Ain't nothing close to it. You can get run over, blown off the deck, fall over the side, step off the deck. Uh, there are so many ways to die on the flight deck of an aircraft carrier that it would make your head spin. The average person doesn't know this, but believe me, if you ever run into a vet who was a flight deck veteran, they'll tell you. If your head ain't doing this all the time, swiveling, then you ain't going to be living very long. But when you're like 22, 23 years old, you have the adrenaline rush. It's great. I mean, it's the world's most dangerous job, and you know it. And you just, and I work nights, even worse, no lights a lot of times on the flight deck. I don't know how many times I tripped over those damn uh, wires. And the first couple of nights when you get on the carrier and boom, when a plane lands, they don't just softly touch down. It looks like it when you see the film. <laughs> when you're living... My ceiling was literally the flight deck, seven inches above me, seven inches armor plate was my ceiling. And on one side, we had a resting gear in our coop, as it's called. We had a resting gear for the uh, number two wire which is the ideal one to hit. You came a little short if you're hitting number one. And on the other side was number three. And when they pull out when those wires, as they, uh, they're, I don't know, that big around, at least, uh, they don't... Uh, pull out silently. There's a screech and then the hydraulics that pull the aircraft to a halt. And that plane comes in and when I have four wearing 71,000 pounds or 70,000 or whatever it is comes in and goes BAM! You're like oh, shit! What the hell just happened? First couple of nights, it keeps you awake after a while. When they're not doing it, you can't sleep. You're like, where's the noise? Where's the boom, boom, boom? And of course for me, the night was the day because I work nights. And then I eventually became a supervisor and had to deal with my chief because I went, you taught me all this crap. I'll be up there. Oh, you need to be here at your desk. No, I don't. My job is to do two things. Scavenge for stuff that we need and uh, how to say this nicely, borrow it from other squadrons, permit-like, and steal it from the folks down there. The snipes, as we call them. Those guys would come up on the deck and you'd look at them and go, oh, Jesus, this guy's never been in the sun for the last five months, and we're out in the Mediterranean floating around. And that's... One of the reasons I recommend the Navy you get to go see the Med, the North Atlantic. I got to go through the Suez Canal and see the Indian Ocean. And then later, I lost my mind and went back in. In 1987, by then I was working for Underrated Laboratories, 
as a technician, and later I moved up to a senior engineering assistant and basically did engineering work the rest of my time there until I went into the IT department. But I went back in 87, you know, and you do two days a month and then two weeks a year, right? I got to go to Japan. I thought, holy shit, I get to go see Japan for free. It's worth your time, folks. If you're an 18 year old kid and you don't know what you really want to do in life, join the Navy. Now, when I first joined up, I was taking all those tests, by the way. They wanted me because of my hearing test become a sonar operator. And I was like, well, what would that entail? They were like, well, you could be on the submarine. I was like, uh, no, you're not putting me in a tube. My brother was on submarines for 30 years, and he's making a fantastic living off his retirement. I didn't stay in long enough. I regret that. I should have. My fault. Not yours. So I got out. And then one day it occurred to me, hmm, I need some excitement. Now when I got off the boat, I had a boatload of cash because you don't spend a lot when you're at sea. Uh, you take a couple of... You know, the U.S. dollar was really high back then. So you, we went into Italy and... I went to Naples and stayed at a motel, hotel, whatever. And it was 4,000 lira for the night. That's like not even four bucks. So a bunch of us packed ourselves into one room and slept wherever we could. And Dealt with it. Got to see the Coliseum and all the damn cats and the city of Rome. You need lots of these little square things that they sold at the pastry shops. But they were actually little squares of pizza. And they were like 50 lira. I thought, like, yeah, give me like five of those. And I'd bring them out to the other guys and here, try that. Go overseas. I know America is a great place to see. I visited it also. But if you get a chance to go for free, join the Navy. That's your number one choice. You'll get to go to all kinds of places. I've been to Egypt. I've been to Spain. We're not even going to go there on Spain. Seven mile long, clothing optional beach. Okay, we've gone there. Uh, but, so I get back. And, you know, it's a little more relaxed when you get home. You know, I had gotten off... When I got off the boat, I had that boatload of cash. So I bought a CB900F Honda because I subscribed to all these magazines, Motorcycle, Cycle World, you name it. And I was obsessed with speed and danger and going fast. So I get the 900F and promptly get enough tickets that I got to a point where when I walked into Jacksonville or the Duval County Courthouse, 
and Jacksonville and Duval County are the same thing. It's one giant city. And uh, I walk in there. And the girl says, hi, Tim. I'm like, I'm paying for the new damn bridge, ain't I? $320 million, I believe I paid bleh, probably 5000 of that. So I come back home after my term, my active duty, and my dad and I went down and saw the motorcycle show in Chicago. Once again, <laughs> Mistake, it was his idea, not mine. So we go down to McCormick Place and we see the motorcycle show. And I sat on a VF 500F interceptor. That's the baby interceptor. And I absolutely, at that moment, fell in love with that bike. And then the light bulb went off. I could race this and try to get killed again. Uh, Yeah, I'm a little addicted to that whole trying to kill yourself thing. So I bought it at Frank Cycles in Zion, Illinois. No longer there. But I had them polish and port it change the valves obviously and mill the heads and put a Yoshi exhaust on it I went from a 68 horsepower really fast bike that would you know, absolutely annihilate most Harley Davidson's at the time to something that was like almost useless on the street you had to hit seven or 8,000 RPMs before it really kicked in. And at that point, up to 13,200. And we also uh, determined that by taking up one of the ignition boxes, the one that had the rev limiter, and plugging in a different, uh, yeah, the same one, the there's one for one and three, and there's one for two and four, or was back then. This thing would just absolutely smoke to about 14,000, and then it would, yeah, you'd have to shift. An American Honda, you know, after much cajoling on the phone, Admitted, yeah, that the rev limit of 13.2 was set by lawyers. And then I got a job. Besides my job at UL. You know, this is all going on. I'm working at Underwriters Lab. And then weekends I'm racing. And then I got a job through Cycle News. Guy down at Berwyn is looking for a rider. And I now have, I didn't even get through half a season in the AMA, American Motorcycle Association, not insisted I get an upgrade from novice to expert. I was like, okay. What does that mean? Well, it cuts down the races you can be in. and Sprint races, 15 lapses. Boring. So this guy hires me at Second City Racing, a guy named John Anderson, and he's in his 30s. Oh, he's really old at that point. Yeah, to me he was. And uh, I, I'm like, so what are you racing? Well, the first race I get to drive on a CBR 900F. Well, I know this bike. I mean, Freddie Spencer drove one. 
and Superbike. And then he went on to race in MotoGP, and he's my hero. Yeah, well, this had an Ontario Mototech kit in it. It was 1,385 cc's, and it was so freaking fast. It had Lockheed calipers and huge, huge discs. I mean, cast iron discs, like almost as big as the wheels. You needed them. It was a beast to stop this. And it was a wiggly, wobbly, horrible race bike. But we did all right the first race. I think we came in fifth or sixth. After six hours of racing, this was endurance racing, mind you. Kind of like Le Mans, one of those. <laughs> <laughs> so two weeks later we get the first of our two bikes we're going to get from a Suzuki dealer who's I don't know what the financial things were but we got our first one Stock pipe. I go to Elkhart Lake, Wisconsin, Road America. Longest track in America. At the time, right around four miles. It's a little longer now because they put some weird chicane in. And uh, I'm going out of the pits. The first time out, I just cracked the throttle about halfway, you know, halfway open. Now, I've ridden it, you know, when I got down there to see the new bike down to Berwyn, which is on the south side of Chicago, he's like, what do you think? I was like, well, that looks good. And he had plenty of money as a car mechanic. And I had plenty of money as an engineer at UL. And I'm like, okay, what do you want me to do? And it was like a Saturday. He goes, go ahead and break it in. I'm like, you took all the headlights and taillights and everything off of it. It's got number plates. It doesn't. He's like, you can outrun the cops. So I did. And then. I didn't have to any cops, but I put on like 350 miles. It was halfway broken. We put fresh oil in a Castro GTX 2050. Greatest oil ever. And then we took it out to Elkhart Lake. So I rolled a lot of the pits, and I did one of those. I mean, that's what you did with the VFR. You know, a little 500. And the next thing I'm looking at is sky. I'm like, oh shit. I'm like, I'm gonna like this. And that was the stock pipe. Before we put the Yoshimura cans, milled the heads, and raised the horsepower up to like 190. It wasn't like three weeks later we show up at Daytona and uh, the way they qualify you is when you registered or during speed trials at Daytona, they did it based on speed. So coming down the back straight away, the, the posts on the fence are 100 feet apart. Just a blur. And that's where you really learn to counter steer. You have to turn a motorcycle to the right to go left, and the left, to, you punch the way you want to go. If you don't believe me, well, if you ever buy a bike, you're going to end up dead. Trust me on that. So I'm, I get back in after one of the uh, 
qualifying runs, and he comes running up to me. He goes, do you know how fast you're going? I was like, no, and I, I don't want to know. We tape over all the glass, the RPMs and everything. And he's like, no, 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 193 miles an hour. I was like, I didn't really need to know that. But after a while, you get used to it. So, I did that until one day I pretty much almost tore my kneecap off at uh, right in Atlanta. I got any of them rumble strips they have for cars. And I was 31 years old. And I went back and did the rest of the race. We came in like fifth, which I was okay with. We were never going to win because John was one of the riders and he was older. And he just wanted to have fun. You know, I wanted to win trophies. I wanted to, yeah, you know, stand up on the podium. Never happened. But I still had a good time. I'd get in like three hours of riding time. WFO with nobody giving me a ticket. It was fantastic. Uh, but that day. I got off the bike, handed it over. We had a third rider right then, and I handed it over to him. We put the fuel in. Out he went. And uh, I ran into a guy named Randy Morris, who used to write for Cycle News, and he's like, you guys did really well. You led the whole first lap. You're blowing them away out there. I was like, yep. Well, you guys are looking up this season. I was like, no. We're done. He's like, you're done? Uh, not the t I was like, not the team, but me. This is my last race. That's it. It's over. I can barely walk. And I did two more sessions on that bike that day after doing that. And sure, once the adrenaline pumps up, the pain's gone. I think football players can tell you about this and other people. But I went home with you know, a knee that was about that big around. It was so painful. It was ridiculous. I couldn't even drive, take my turn to drive the motorhome back from Atlanta to Chicago. I was like, yeah, that, that's not happening. So, then I went back to the mundane life of Working at UL. Boring. Way boring. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I got into computers. And that was another risk. It was new. It was the future. And that's how I ended up on YouTube. Excitement. Oh, I left out the part where I learned how to fly airplanes. And it was a long time ago when my eyesight was good enough to fly with glasses on. I wouldn't trust me with a bad heart to pilot an aircraft unless it was going down. That's all I got for tonight. Thanks for watching.